But in the digital computer, control is achieved electronically in strict conformity with instructions provided the machine by the human programmer. The great power of the computer resides in its ability to carry out whatever arithmetic or logical operations the mind of man is capable of instructing the machine to perform. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to know more about the inner workings of computers, of programming languages, of emulators, of games. But it was hard as a child to get started with all of this, even though I had a lot of interest. But now this has changed. With languages like Rust, you can actually extend programming languages quite easily. And I will show you how by writing a Python extension with PyO3, which is a very, very nice framework for just this. To get started, you just need three things. You just need Rust, a Python interpreter, and PyO3. My name is Matthias Endler, and you're watching Hello Rust. You might be asking why a Python extension? Why not a PHP extension or a Ruby extension or whatever? Well, the reason is I know Python best. But in addition to that, Python and Rust are quite a nice combination, I have to say. Python is a very, very high level language with a lot of uh, very nice abstractions and Rust provides almost the same high level concepts, but on a much lower level, on a level closer to the machine. Rust, for example, can hook right into the Python interpreter because it doesn't have a garbage collector and it doesn't have a runtime. But let's just get started. The extension that we're going to write is going to be very, very simple. It's just going to be a re-implementation of the Python length, length function. So if you have a string, you say length of hello, then you get the length of the string back. And this is what we're trying to implement. So first I will create a new library called uh, lenrs. Um, I say cargo new minus minus lib lenrs. I open the project in my editor. I have a couple of files here. You can see that I already created our little skeleton. First off, let's look at the setup.py file, which is a Python way to describe how to do packaging. And in here you can find all the requirements for our library and how to install it and any special things. First, a few imports, sys and setup tools. Um, this will use setup tools Rust as well, which provides the bindings for the extension. This block here will install it for you when you run setup.py for the first time. It will just try to import it. If that fails, then it will do a sub process call uh, saying pip install setup tools rust. Pip is the Python package manager. And if there was a failure, then we will raise an exception. Else the import was successful and no, the install was successful and now we can import it. This setup requires says that we need setup tools rust bigger than 092 for the installation process so setup pi requires that and install requires defines all the dependencies of our own package that are needed as modules during installation of our package so that could be all the modules that you use internally in your extension and right at the bottom we have this lovely setup function here um, which takes a couple of named arguments the first is the name of our module or extension uh, len rs then we define a version a few classifiers which define how stable our package is what's the intended audience so in this case developers um, programming languages that we used, uh, on which uh, operating systems it runs, the license, and so on. And here's the interesting part for Rust. Um, you have those Rust extensions, and that is what Setup Tools Rust is using internally to figure out what we actually want. 
and how to compile that into a Python module. Uh, there's a Rust extension class here that's going to be used and it takes a few arguments. The first is uh, some underscore lenrs in our lenrs module, um, which is uh, the bindings uh, for our module and we will get to that in a second. Then we have a cargo tomo, which is um, where the dependencies of our Rust extension are to be found. So usually that's a cargo tomo, but sometimes you have your extension in a sub project, then maybe you want to adjust that. You can find more information on that on the setup tools Rust homepage. Yeah, I just use the defaults in this case. But now let's get into the Rust code. We have a cargo tomo here, which again defines the name of our extension from the Rust side. That's the library, the Rust library that we're going to build, a version, author. Uh, we don't have dependencies right now um, other than PyO3, which we want to use in the latest version. So check your versions. And then there's a section about how to create the library itself. And in this case, we need to choose C dulib as the create type, which creates a dynamically linked library, just like the C Python extensions would do. And another name field, and I forgot for what that was, but maybe it's not needed. Then the next important thing is that we create a folder with the same name as our extension. And in it, uh, we have an init file. And there we define the bindings uh, for our extension. And in this case, we only have one binding, uh, which is a binding to the len function. And that's going to be in our underscore len rs module. So the dot means uh, in the local directory and underscore len rs is the module that we're going to define in a second. And we're going to define that in our libRS. So that's a pretty basic uh, libRS. Uh, let's get rid of all of those. We need to use procedural macros. If you don't know what procedural macros are, that's fine. I guess I will do a show about it um, sometime in the future. For now, you just got to know that those are the things that you add above your structs to make them um, to add some more functionality. For example, uh, you've seen already that we've used the debug trade a lot and there you can derive the debug trade for your own struct which saves you some typing and you will see how that comes into play later on and additionally we need proc mathro path invocations um, that just allows us to have more than to have a path separator in our macro so if you have a macro my macro colon colon something uh, you can have something like namespaces in macros and this is behind a feature gate so we also need to have that. Now let's import our PyO3 create which we need to add and for that we first need to switch to a nightly compiler. Uh, you can use uh, rustup and uh, you can say rustup override set nightly to use the nightly compiler and there let's add our PyO3 create all good. Now PyO3 comes with a preload which offers a few helper methods to get us started. And now we can write our first function. And by definition we need a module around our functions and we just yeah invoke the init function. So fn init it takes two arguments pi which will be of type Python, which is the Python interpreter, the Python runtime, and M, which is a borrow to a Python module. And that will be hooked into with a derive. And we return a pi result, which just is any Python object or an error. In this case, we return the unit type if everything works out well. So we say OK with the unit type. And in here we can now define our function. But first, let's add another derive pi mod init 
underscore len rs. This is where the underscore len rs comes from. Okay, let's define a function here. Um, len. Every function gets a Python interpreter automatically hooked in. And in this case, we take a string as an argument, um, a stir, and we return another pi result, but not an empty one. We return a pi object. And we return OK s.length and then we need to make that a python object and the way this works is we tell the python interpreter to create an object for us so this is why we pass in the python interpreter to our to object function and it will return a python object we'll create one for our output PyO3 defines into traits for many, many uh, different Rust types. So, for example, this works for strings, for integers, uh, for vectors, and so on. So, the final thing we have to do is declare this um, function as um, a Python function. And there's another macro for that saying pyfn. Um, M, which is a reference to the module and the name of the function on the Python side. Let's just call it length. Um, and we should be good to go. Cargo build. Nice. Um, it was compiling. It seems like we don't need this uh, macro use in that case, so we can get rid of it. Compiling again, and now we have a very, very clean Python extension. You might be wondering how to install that. Well, setup.py. Python 3 setup.py install. So it actually compiled. And it actually installed. You can see that there's a lot going on here. Uh, it will run install and bdist egg. Egg is just a way to deploy binaries in the Python ecosystem. And here we compile for our platform. So right now I run on macOS 10.12 and then a dist folder which just contains our final egg file. Yeah, and then it's installed. So let's use it. But it's very important that you go outside of this directory now and try it somewhere else because otherwise the Python interpreter will try to import our uh, module from our current directory and it, it contains a lenrs folder and by convention if it's a lenrs folder so the same name that the module that you kind of want to import and it contains an init.py, then it's gonna use that. Oh, maybe I can try, I can show you what happens. So Python 3, and I say import lenrs, and we'll say um, no module named lenrs underscore lenrs, and uh, that's because it's looking at the wrong folder. Okay, but if I go uh, to my home folder, for example, I do the same thing. I open my Python 3 interpreter, I say import len, no, len rs, and I say give me the length of hello rust, 11. I don't know about you, but stuff like this always makes me very, very happy. It's something that not many people can understand, but it's fun when you talk to a machine on a lower level somehow, I guess. The tricky thing is, if we have a different input type, for example, an array or a list, as you say in Python, so with three entries, and you want to get the length of that, oops, um, I showed you the built-in length uh, function. If you want to call our len rs, we need to say len rs dot len. but it produces the same output. Not always though, uh, as I showed you with the lists, 
uh, if we do the same here. We get a type error. And that's because we can't handle lists yet. So I guess we need to dive a little deeper. Now the problem is that in our code we accept a string as an input. But we want to also handle lists and we want to also handle whatever else, uh, whatever kind of Python object. So we need to ex accept a generic Python object and then match on the type. Of course, that has a bit of a runtime overhead, but that's kind of unavoidable. Python is a very uh, dynamic language, so you can do a lot of type shenanigans at runtime and you need to cope with that. Instead of accepting a string, what we want to accept is an object. And that is going to be of type pi object. Now we can't use uh, the direct call to length anymore. We need to extract some other type from our Python object, some ROS type from our Python object type. And for that there's a method called extract. Here's the docs. You see that this function takes two arguments. One is self, so actually it's a method, a method on a Python uh, object and then it takes our Python runtime to extract some type from, from this Python object and it returns a pi result of d where d is anything that is from pi object and it has a lifetime of p which is the lifetime of the Python Jill which is the global interpreter lock. It's just a global lifetime. As long as the interpreter is around, this thing will also be around. And who implements from pi object? Well, a lot of things. Um, option. Uh, what else do we have here? F64, F32, um, st string. Um, all of the nice stuff. And somewhere in here, I guess there's also VEC. Yeah, here. So Vector also supports it. So the way to use it is we want to extract the string here. So we say object dot extract colon colon string. So that's an own string type. And that also requires the Python interpreter. That will return s, where s is actually a result of type string. And some error. What we could do easily is now match on this string and say, if it was a string, then Let's work with that. Otherwise, we would have to return some error, but I don't know which error to return. And really, I want to let this get handled by the Python interpreter itself or by the PyO3 runtime. One thing you can always do, which is very convenient, is using any predefined Python error in your Rust code and that is what PyO3 provides. So you create a Py error new and you define the type of the error, for example a type error. Does that still compile? I mean we haven't really added lists yet but uh, that would be a start. Cargo build. No because we need to return a result and we return a result or a pi error. But that's really good that this happened <laughs> because you can see that the error messages are a bit abysmal and that's because 
the procedural macros hide a lot of what's going on. Uh, instead of getting the correct line number of where the error happened, you just get that it happened inside of the macro invocation. And that can be a bit problematic when you have a bigger code base. So after a bit of back and forth, what I found was that when you comment out those procedural macros, you get much better, much more readable error messages. So in this case, it will tell you right away where the error is. It will say match arm with an incompatible type. And well, that's our problem. And another problem is that length is not defined on our result type, which is obvious because now here that needs to be string.length. But I don't really know how to fix the second problem now. Maybe just by saying error. <laughs> Let's comment that back in. Now it compiles, but we haven't really won anything except for adding some dynamic overhead. We can still extract the string and calculate the length, but not much else. Um, but it's easy now to add more types. Uh, does it really run? Okay, it still works. Okay, let's add another type. But before we do that, um, let me clean up the code a little bit. It's uh, a bit ugly. Um, and for that, there's a very nice um, statement in Rust called if let. And uh, we don't need to do those match arms shenanigans anymore. The way it works is if let OKS no. then we have a proper value and we can already work with this. Get rid of this. Move that in here and now return that. Get rid of the exception, much better. I guess it still won't compile. Um, because this needs to be S. We now can handle different types here. And the way this could work, for example, is that we try to extract a vector from this now. So a vector of strings. Let's call it V. And let's return the length of V. And if all else fails, then we return a type error. Okay, let me try to compile that. And it does really compile. Okay, I'm surprised. Set up pi install. Go to a different folder. And now let's try with a list. Nice and gentle. Let's try some other unsupported type. Ah, I was using the wrong length function again. Ah, uh, damn it, sorry. But it still works, yeah. 
but with a different type. will give us a type error with the correct error message. There is of course a lot more to learn around this topic and I'm also still learning this as I go. If however you like that part and you want to work more with the internals, I created a project, a bigger project, which I'm planning to maintain for a longer time, which is called HyperJSON. It's a JSON encoder and decoder for Python similar to the JSON module that is built in and similar to Ultra JSON, which is a competitor written in C. My plan is to write an encoder that doesn't have any sec faults and is still as fast as the C implementation. If you want, then check this project out. I would be very happy to have you as a contributor, even if it's just a minor thing or a cleanup or adding a test. And as always, if you like this video or you learned something, please let me know by hitting the like button. And if you want me to do more of those videos and you like this channel in general, then please also subscribe. And with that said, I see you next time.